My name is Don Mercer, and in this video we will look at the initial preparation steps for drying processes. Financial support for production of this series of video presentations was provided by the Széchenyi Society, founders of the Hungarian programs at the University of Toronto. The Széchenyi Society sponsorship is gratefully acknowledged. I would personally like to thank Dr. Leventi Diashadi, professional engineer and fellow of the International Academy of Food Science and Technology, who is a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry at the University of Toronto. Dr. Diashadi's considerable efforts in coordinating this project are greatly appreciated. The material in these video presentations is based on an ebook published in November of 2014. Its title is An Introduction to the Dehydration and Drying of Fruits and Vegetables. It is available on the International Union of Food Science and Technology website, which can be accessed at www.iufost.org. We will begin with a brief introduction followed by information on sanitation, cross-contamination, selecting of raw materials, preparing the raw materials for drying, basic shapes of raw materials, surface effects on drying, and reducing chemical reactions. We will then look at loading the dryer, how to test for doneness, storage conditions for the finished product, and we will finish up with some summary comments. The way in which you prepare the materials will have a pronounced effect on the manner in which they dry. This, in turn, can influence the quality and finished product attributes. Care at this stage of the process will lead to better results in the end. Good manufacturing practices, also referred to as GMPs, must be followed in each step. Cleanliness, of course, is imperative so don't forget the soap. All surfaces and equipment must be clean and should be sanitized with a chlorine solution which can be easily made from household bleach. You can follow the directions on the label or you may also find instructions on the internet. You also need to wash the incoming raw materials to remove any loose debris that might be clinging to their surfaces. Washing will also remove insects and other surface contamination. Some processors use a mild chlorine rinse followed by a freshwater rinse. All water used in the processing area must be potable and windows should be screened to keep insects out of the processing areas as well. No animals, including pets, should be allowed in the processing area, and I have often seen this in small-scale processing areas. And the list goes on. Cross-contamination is a major area of concern. You do not want incoming raw material to contact your finished product. Here we see raw materials and finished product and we don't want there to be any way of having contact between these two entities. So we need to have a barrier established and any raw materials will meet this barrier and not be permitted into the finished product area. And any finished product will not come in contact with raw materials while being moved to a warehouse or storage area. Workers handling raw materials should not be handling finished products without taking proper sanitary precautions. Things like hairnets being required, lab coats being worn, and maintaining restricted areas go a long way to prevent cross-contamination. Hand washing is a key factor in preventing cross-contamination and the spread of microorganisms in general. Try to have a logical flow of materials through your processing area even if you are doing things at home. So if your process consists of three steps, A, B, and C, you may want to have step A completed in isolation from step B and then complete step B before step C is undertaken. 
then you can move the finished product off into the storage area or into another production location. Now we'll take a look at selecting raw materials. We have already mentioned that raw materials must be of the highest possible quality. They should be free from bruises, blemishes, and surface contamination. Once this is done, you can move on to the next steps. Now we can look at preparing the raw materials. A basic understanding of how drying occurs is necessary in order to understand how to prepare your raw materials. We will look at the actual drying mechanisms in a future presentation, but we can make some generalizations here. For now, it will suffice to know that initially, moisture is generally removed from the surface of the material. So here we have a material with a saturated surface from which water is removed. Once the initial water is removed from the surface, additional water removal relies on moisture traveling from the inner portions of the material to the surface where it can evaporate. Here is the center line of the product and we have moisture traveling to the surface by a process known as diffusion. As drying progresses, there is less and less moisture available to travel to the surface, so drying will slow down considerably. And if you look at a plot of the rate of water removal versus time, you will see a general decrease in the rate as the drying process progresses. You should look at drying as the transfer of moisture from the middle of the material outwards. And that's shown in this diagram where we have the center line of the material and moisture proceeding from the center outwards to the surface where it is evaporated. Knowing that moisture must travel from the inside of the material to its surface for removal, you can address this by cutting your product into thin slices and taking other suitable action. Let's look at the basic shapes of foods involved in drying. There are three basic shapes of materials when it comes to drying. Each one of these presents its own characteristics. They are flat slabs or plates, spheres, and cylinders. Spheres are typically little ball-shaped objects. Cylinders are long objects which have a circular cross-section. And then we have flat slabs, which I've shown here by this flat piece of wood. Spheres don't always have to be totally round. Here you see a shape that will actually approximate a sphere in a dryer, and we'll explain that in a moment. Cylinders don't always have to be round. They can be long and have a square cross-section. And slabs can be shaped like this, which is similar to a hamburger patty. Some materials may be dried on the basis of all three shapes. Carrots may be prepared as flat slices, spheres, and cylinders. We will use them as an example to define the basic shapes and show how well they dry. Here we see a carrot in its three different basic shapes. Carrots as flat slices dry quite well. In the top of the photograph, you see the carrots before drying, and the three slices in the bottom are dried carrots. When they are prepared as spheres, they do not dry very well. And what classes these as spheres is that the cross-sectional diameter and the length of each carrot segment are approximately equal, so the cross-sectional area and the side surfaces have a role to play in the drying. However, there is a slight exception in the case of carrots. Carrots are naturally cylindrical shape. Here is a cylinder that's approximately 10 centimeters long, and when dried, it did not dry very well at all. The characteristic shape and the structure of the raw material will determine how the moisture is lost. Carrots have capillaries that run lengthwise through them. Cutting the carrots into thin slices minimizes the distance water has to travel to be removed and leverages the flow of moisture through the capillaries. Look at the half thickness of the carrot slice to see how far the water must travel to get out of the carrot slice. So here we have a carrot slice 
and we have the center line which marks the half thickness. Moisture will then need to travel this distance to reach the top surface and a correspondingly equal distance to reach the bottom surface. The distance is equal to one half the thickness. In thick chunks the carrot approximates a sphere. Water has further to travel to escape and there is actually little loss through the sides of the chunks due to the orientation of the capillaries but the shape is essentially classed as a sphere for drying purposes. In its natural shape the carrot approximates a cylinder. Water has a long way to travel to escape through the ends. The effect of the capillaries minimizes water loss through the sides. Drying is very slow as a result. The bottom line is to select the configuration that offers the best opportunities for moisture loss. Generally, flat plates or slabs work well, especially when they are thin. In the case of spherical or cylindrical materials, the moisture normally travels along the radius to reach the outside surface. For this reason, small diameter pieces dry faster than those with a large diameter. So if you have a radius R and you double that to get a radius of 2R, the drying will take twice as long or maybe even more to occur. Now we can look at the surface effects on drying. Try to think of how material will dry in terms of its physical structure and characteristics. Berries are a real challenge to dry if you don't think about what their role is in nature. And here are some cranberries in an aluminum tray. The function of a berry is to protect the seeds of the plant to ensure there will be a next generation of plants and to increase their numbers. There is often a thick outer skin or waxy cuticle designed to keep water inside the fleshy portion of the berry. If nature is working to protect the seeds by keeping the moisture inside the berry, then you are going to be challenged in drying the berries if you leave them whole. The simple answer is to cut the berries in half or mash them before drying. The berries will behave much differently in the dryer then. You may notice that some fruits turn color while they are drying. Apples tend to brown if you leave them in the air. Oxygen in the air is reacting with the sugars and other components in the apples in this Maillard browning reaction. Here we have an apple that has been freshly cut. In this case we have an apple on the left which has been freshly cut and then allowed to sit in the air for approximately 20 minutes or half an hour and you can see the brownness starting to develop. A slight browning may not be a concern. You can, however, use vitamin C to help reduce browning. The vitamin C that is present consumes oxygen and prevents the browning from occurring. There are powdered preparations available which can be prepared and used as a dip for sliced apples and other sensitive fruits. You just shake off the excess solution as you remove the apple slices from the rinse. The small amount of liquid remaining on the surface is easily removed in the first few minutes of drying. If you prefer, you can use fresh lemon juice or lemon juice concentrate. It will not make your product, such as apples or mangoes, taste like lemons. With sliced material, it's easy to position your pieces in the dryer as you load it. You simply place them side by side on the racks in the dryer so that they are spaced evenly and are not touching or overlapping. This photograph shows some carambola or star fruit on a lab scale dryer rack and you can see that they are not placed terribly close together and there could be a little bit closer spacing but that's not the issue here. Shredded or mashed material is more awkward to handle. First you may need to place a mesh on the drying rack to prevent the material from falling through the openings. You may have to do this with small particles as well. Then you will need to spread the mashed or shredded material as evenly as possible on the mesh without getting any excessively thin or thick spots that will alter the uniformity of the drying process. With mashed material 
you may also have to stir the bed on occasion during drying. Once the drying proceeds, there's always the issue of testing for doneness. You will need to check your dryer regularly once the product is approaching its final stages of drying. Each product will have its own attributes to indicate that it has been dried satisfactorily. One of the best ways to test for doneness is to remove pieces and bend them and see whether they're dry and leathery, but this isn't always foolproof. You need to have a well-defined indicator of doneness for your tests. After drying, the product should be stored properly in sealed, airtight containers and placed in a cool, dark location. So in summary, please do not underestimate the importance of the steps involved in preparing your materials for drying. Time and care taken at the outset can have a significant impact on the quality of the final product. Something as simple as ensuring that all slices are of the same thickness can enhance the degree of uniformity in the drying process as we shall see later. Thank you very much.